the primary criticism of virtually every paranormal story out there is a lack of credibility. Either the person claiming the events happened lacks credibility themselves, or you just don't have any other corroborating evidence, like other people that witnessed it, other credible people that witnessed it, or in many cases, a lack of video or photo proof that said paranormal event happened. But in the case of the story today, you not only have a highly credible witness, a NASA robotics engineer, you also have other corroborating witnesses that are from that NASA engineer's family that were there and witnessed it with him. And you have, albeit limited, you do have video footage of what they are claiming happened that was paranormal. But before we get into all of that in today's story, if you are a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, well, that's what my channel is all about, and I upload three to four times a week. So if that's your thing, if you could gently pulverize the like button and then turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my uploads every week. All right, let's get into it. Bill Vale has always been incredibly scientifically minded. He's always had technical jobs his whole life. He took a job for 15 years at NASA as a robotics engineer. He also spent a little time as a pilot for NASA as well. He is just somebody that is very process oriented. And, and in fact, his family and friends, they say this with respect, but they say that, you know, Bill, he lacks an imagination. He's just, he's super pragmatic, super to the point, and doesn't really have time for, call it creativity. He's all about facts. In 2002, Bill and his wife separate, and it catches Bill a little bit off guard. And it almost prompts like a midlife crisis for him where, you know, before it had been really his work with NASA uh, that had been fulfilling to him. And now he has this huge gap in his life and suddenly, you know, he's looking around and he's like, what am I doing all this for? I don't have a family anymore. Like, what am I doing? And so he decides to move back home to Arlington, Texas, where his little brother lived. So when he gets to Arlington, he feels like he can have a fresh start in a way. You know, it's he has family around, so he doesn't feel quite as lonely. And he actually just takes a job at his brother's water purification company because he wasn't sure what he was going to do. He just knew that he needed to do something. So he gets a job at this water purification company and he starts working with his brother and he finds that even though it's not the same type of work that he was doing as a robotics engineer at NASA, it was nice to be working day in and day out with a family member. So Bill has only been living in Arlington for just a couple of months, and he had only been at the water purification company for maybe a couple of weeks. And so when a Saturday house call was called into the company and no one really wanted to do it, Bill thought, you know what, I'll, I'll take one for the team, make a good impression on my coworkers, and I'll take the house call. And what it involved is, is part of Bill's job was to go demonstrate how to install and use this water purification system in customers' home. The dispatcher for the water purification company said to Bill, she goes, hey, listen, this is a little bit weird, but the person who called was adamant that you be there at five o'clock, not a minute earlier, not a minute later. And it was probably only about three o'clock in the afternoon. And he's like, so what do I do? And she's like, I don't know, like, go get a bite to eat and just make sure you're there by five. And so he does that. He's like, that's weird. But he drives around and he parks outside of the house a little ways down the street. And a couple minutes before five, he gets out and he starts heading over to the property to do this, this house call. He starts walking up the path to this, this big brick house at like 4.59. And as he's getting closer to the steps, he can hear through the front door, which he can already tell it's slightly open. It's not latched all the way. He can hear screaming inside of this house. It sounds like a woman screaming and it actually sounds like she's screaming, get out of here. But he doesn't really know what to make of it. He has a job to do, so he walks up to the door and even though it's open, he knocks. And now he can literally hear through the crack in the door that someone in this house is screaming. And he's listening and finally he decides, well, I should probably just open it up and make sure everything's okay. Cause I can hear someone screaming inside, the door's open. So he opens it up and he walks inside. He takes one step inside of the residence and just kind of peeks around. And he can see a little bit down the hall off to the right, there's an, an opening to a room. And in the room are three men on their knees uh, in a little circle. And a woman is walking around them in a circle and she's holding a book in her hand and she's speaking in tongues. 
just nonsensical, couldn't make sense of her language, but periodically as she's circling them and she's touching each of their heads, she's screaming, get out of here, leave these people, get out of here. Bill is about to leave. He knows that this is just too weird for him, but right before he does, the woman who's walking around the three men on the ground looks up at him and points directly at him and doesn't break eye contact and just holds her finger out pointing at him. And he gets this very strange sense that like this woman wants to do harm to him. And so he just runs out the door and is like, yeah, I'm not going back in there. Goes back to his car and he calls the dispatcher back at the water purification company. And he's like, okay, I just took an insane house call. The lady in there is crazy. I'm not doing it. Don't reschedule. And if you do, do not put me on it because I will not go in there. Bill was a very straightforward guy. And he's just not gonna let his imagination run wild with what they were doing. You know, those people are crazy and that's not my business, it's not my problem. And so he forgot about it. He just goes home to his house and he turns on the TV and he gets his microwave dinner and he's just sitting there eating his food and just having a nice Saturday night to himself. When out of the corner of his eye in, in this other room, and I keep in mind, Bill lives alone and has no pets. Out of the corner of his eye, he thinks he sees something small dart across the ground. He couldn't tell if it was flying through the room or if it was running through the room, but he just was like, oh, now I got you know some rodent or a bird or something in my house. It must've snuck in through the chimney. And so Bill is not scared. He's mostly like frustrated that now he has to deal with some rodent in his house or some bird in his house. So he puts his food down and he turns on all the lights because he was watching TV with the lights off, turns on all the lights and just searches his house. He's like quiet, listening, trying to like hear where the thing went in his house and he can't hear anything. And after over an hour, uh, he just decides, well, geez, I, I don't know where it went. I don't know what it was. Maybe I didn't even see it in the first place. So that night he wakes up suddenly to what feels like some small creature running over the foot of his bed, but like over his foot. And it instantly wakes him up and he instinctively sucks his legs up to his chest under his covers. You know, as, as pretty much anybody would do when some random creature is running on your feet in the middle of the night. And he's like, great, this thing, it's probably now you can tell it's a rat, it's a, it's a rodent. He's like, great, now it's literally in my bedroom on my bed. And so he flips on the lights and now he's just mad because this is right in the middle of the night, it's the last thing he needs. And he lights on and he searches the room. He looks under you know, his dresser, he looks in the closet, he looks under his bed, he looks everywhere. And he can't find this thing, he can't, he's, he's stopping periodically to listen and he can't hear scurrying or anything. Did I imagine that as well? Cause I mean, I guess I don't know if I saw something darting out of the corner of my eye when I was watching TV. I think I did. And just now, could, it, could that have been in my dream? You know, cause he didn't, he wasn't really awake for it happening. He woke up to it and thought it's what happened. And so he's starting to like tell himself that, you know what? I'm somehow creating this weird thought in my head. Like I probably didn't see anything downstairs and I was probably having a dream about this, you know, rodent in my house and that's what prompted the, the thought that something had touched my feet. And so he's like, all right, whatever. Turns off his lights and he goes back to bed. So Bill falls back asleep, but shortly thereafter, he wakes up again when his bed is violently shaking. And he wakes up and his bed's shaking and it stops almost immediately once he's awake. And he thinks that they're having an earthquake. So he jumps out of his bed and he, he's looking around to see if like things are gonna start falling on him. He, he runs to the window, he looks outside, he can't tell what's going on. He, he runs into the other room and he can suddenly tell, because he's in a bit of a panic, that there is no more shaking happening. Now, the shaking's done, the house is totally silent. And he runs back to his, his bed and he has this thought like, could I in my sleep have shaken my bed? And he had one of those huge four poster beds. Then he's like trying to move it. And Bill's a big, strong guy and he can barely move his bed. And he has this, like this memory of my bed was literally shaking. And he's like, now this is three times that something strange has happened and I can't make sense of it. And being a very kind of pragmatic person and not one with, as his family said, a wild imagination, he did not have that. He's like, okay, let's find out if there was an earthquake. So he goes online and he starts researching earthquakes. And he's thinking maybe if the earthquake had just happened that the, the news would break right then and there, some headline, there's nothing. And so he's like, okay, what other rational things could have caused my house to shake? Because again, there's no other damage in his house. Nothing fell, it was just, he, he felt the shaking and that was it. And so he starts researching like what's in the area and he finds that uh, there was a military base and actually it's an air base right near his house, a couple miles away. 
And he's thinking, okay, well, you know, when the fighter jets are taking off, that take off at all hours, maybe there's a sonic boom from, from one of the jets accelerating. And, and he didn't know if that was it, but he thought it could be it. And then he's like, oh, well, there's also all these oil rigs that are drilling in the area. Maybe there was an accident. So he's researching for, you know, recent accidents at, at oil rigs. And he's just, he's trying to find a rational explanation for this bed shaking incident. He also can't help but feel like, what happened with that thing I saw that was like touching my feet? Like he's not connecting the two events, but he has this weird sense that either something's wrong with him and he's losing his mind or something really weird is happening in his property. So as he's trying to find this rational explanation, his internet goes out. And so he tries troubleshooting it a couple times, but he can't get it to work. And so he calls a service provider to just have them see if they can fix it. And so he calls customer service, somebody picks up and they're like, yep, your internet's out, let me fix it for you. Let me put you on a brief hold. And so they put him on hold. And as he's sitting there, like listening to elevator music, like staticky sounds started coming through the receiver and he's just noticing it, it's nothing significant. But then a voice comes into the phone that is speaking in tongues, like nonsensical language and it sounds almost threatening. At some point, Bill is just totally unsettled by this voice because it's just going on and on. He's been on hold now for like two minutes of this weird voice and he just hangs up. And like in just a couple of seconds, he gets a call back from the same customer service rep that he had just been speaking to. And he, he had an accent and Bill picked up on it and said, hey, was I just talking to you? And the customer service rep was like, yes, yeah, sorry, we got disconnected. And Bill says, did you hear that, that voice? Did you hear that strange voice on the phone? And the customer service rep, who's mostly operates on a bit of a script, kind of deviates for a second and says, actually, yes, I did hear that. And I was actually trying to figure out how that could have been possible because we use a very secure phone line when we talk to our customers and there's really no way for someone to actually block my ability to speak to you. Like even if someone was on the call, you would still be able to hear me and I was trying to yell to you and you weren't hearing me. So I, I don't know how that would have happened. If I definitely heard the voice, I don't know what that was and we're so sorry. So both of them are definitely weirded out by it, but you know, the customer service rep, he's got a job to do and he's like, hey, your internet works again. Thanks, talk to you soon. He hangs up and Bill's left with his internet working again, but now that's the fourth strange thing. He has the thing that runs across the room uh, as he's watching TV. He has the thing that ran across his feet at night. He has his bed shaking, and now he has this like devil voice speaking in tongues on the phone that the customer service rep also heard and couldn't make sense of. He decides to, you know, I'm, I'm done doing research for the night. It's, you know, three in the morning or whatever it was. I'm going to just try to get a couple hours of sleep uh, because this is just starting to freak me out a little bit. So Bill gets back in his bed and he's trying to sleep, but he can't stop thinking about the fact that there have been four strange occurrences in the span of just a couple of hours. And he's, he can't help himself, but start to feel a little bit worried that something that he doesn't understand is going on. Something bad is going on. And as he's sitting there desperately trying to sleep, he swears he can hear some sort of sound underneath his bed. He knows it could be his mind playing tricks on him, but it doesn't matter. He thinks he hears it and, it, and it's now he's officially spooked. Like a child, he pulls the covers over his head and he's just laying on his bed with the covers over his head, just basically trying to convince himself like this isn't happening. There isn't anything under your bed. Just relax, nothing's happening. He's got his legs sucked up you know, up near his chest, he's just under his sheets. And he, the way he was positioned is he had left a light on in his room and there was a light basically beaming down uh, onto the sheet that was over the upper part of his body. So there's a little bit of light into the cavern under his sheets. And so he's holding it up over his head. And as he's sitting there, like trying to, trying to tell himself that nothing's going on, he looks down towards the foot of his bed under his covers, right? and he sees a hand slowly reaching up from the side of the bed, come up and try to grab his foot. And it just misses and then retracts out from under the bed. Bill literally leaps out of bed, flips on every light and is now in just absolute crisis mode. He immediately is like up against the wall, doesn't even want to live under the bed, but eventually he does, he kind of pokes under, nothing's down there. He looks around his room, there's no sign of anybody in the room. And now it's like, okay, you've had so many strange occurrences and none of it makes sense. Like, what are you going to do? And he had no idea. So Bill does not attempt to go back to bed that night. He goes downstairs, flips on every light in his house, 
starts drinking coffee like he's awake. He's like, I'm not doing this tonight. And so he stays up the rest of the night. So the next day, Bill just tries to have a normal day. He doesn't want to think about what happened the night before. So he goes to work like normal, doesn't tell anybody about it. Again, Bill, he's a straight shooter. He's not about to be, you know, the former NASA robotics engineer. It's like, hey, let me tell you about the paranormal stuff that's happening in my house. He's just, he's doing everything he can to not think like that. And so by the end of the day, he, he started to feel a little bit of anxiety as he's getting ready to go back to his house um, because he would have to potentially face some of the strange things that happened the night before. They could happen again tonight. And so he gets home, has all his lights on. You know, he's not he's not about to keep his lights off and he's sitting in his in his chair. He always sits in the same one where he was watching TV and saw that thing dart across the room. He's sitting there and he's eating his microwave dinner and he's watching TV, again, all the lights on in his house. And he looks down for a minute to get another bite of food. And when he looks up, a bottle is zinging towards him and he moves his head out of the way and it hits the wall beside him and it breaks. It's a glass bottle and shatters on the ground. And then all the lights in the house go out. So Bill runs to the closet where he knows he has a flashlight. He opens it up, reaches for the flashlight. And as he's about to pull it out, he hears in the closet towards the top of the closet, this loud slamming sound. And he had a couple pretty heavy boxes on the very top shelf in his closet. And it sounded like someone had almost lifted one up and then slammed it down on the top shelf. But obviously he didn't do that and it totally freaked him out. He grabs the flashlight, shines it in the closet. There's no one in there, there's nothing in there. And he backs out and then the lights come back on. And his heart's racing because he knows what just happened. Someone just threw a bottle at his head. You know, someone just slammed something in his closet and he's in full panic mode. And so the only person he can think to call is his brother because he's not prepared to go to the police because the things he would need to describe are kind of nonsensical sounding. But his brother, who's very rational, equally kind of pragmatic in his approach to everything, he calls his brother and he's like, get over here. I got some weird stuff happening in my house and I just need a sanity check. And so his brother, Bob, his younger brother, Bob, he comes over. And as soon as Bob gets there, Bill is like, he had never had a discussion about the paranormal with his brother before. So he's just like, all right, this is gonna sound weird, but Bob, I need you to just go in this closet and just, just go in the closet. And Bob's like, what in the world are you talking about? And Bill's like, please just go in there. I'm gonna shut the door and I want you to just tell me what happens. And so Bob's like, all right. Bob goes in the closet, Bill shuts the door behind him. Bill's just out there waiting. And Bill calls to Bob, hey, uh, turn off the light. There's a little uh, pull string, little tiny light bulb. Turn off the light in there. So, you know, Bob's like, all right. Turns off the light and it's pitch black in there. And so at the time, Bob would not tell Bill what happened to him in the closet. Mostly because if you put yourself in Bob's position, he doesn't have any of the context. He doesn't have anything that happened. He's never experienced anything like this before. And so what he experiences, he kind of chalks up to probably his own doing. He doesn't think that someone did it to him. And so what happens is he's in the closet and he feels something hit his leg. And he thinks, oh, I must have knocked into something that hit my leg, like a pair of shoes or something. And he's just standing there. And then something hits him hard in the face. And he thinks, oh, you know, I must have, I must have hit something on the top shelf that fell and hit me in the head. But the two things combined, it did unsettle him a little bit. And he consciously decided, I'm not going to tell my brother Bill that this happened because I'll only feed into his own paranoia right now. And that's not what he needs. Opens the closet, gets out, and he's like, you know what, Bill? Nothing happened in there. You got nothing to worry about. There's nothing in here. And so he leaves and Bill is left kind of crestfallen because he feels like he really didn't do a good job conveying to his brother just how much had happened in the house so far. He basically said, oh, I've, heard, I've heard some strange noises, go in the closet. And then nothing really happened. So he feels like out of his element. He just feels like he doesn't know how to handle it. And so he has only one other person that he feels comfortable kind of letting in to this situation because it was just kind of embarrassing for, for Bill. I mean, he's this esteemed NASA employee. The last thing he wants is to have somebody think that he's like losing his mind a little bit. But he has his friend, Michael, who is a sound engineer that works for a couple podcasts. And when he calls him, Bill doesn't even really know what he's gonna say to Michael. He just needed to talk to someone, like a friendly voice kind of thing. And he calls him and, and Michael's a little bit surprised to see Bill calling him and they have a little bit of small talk. And uh, Bill says to Michael, you know, I, I don't know how to approach this with you, but I just, I, I moved to Arlington and I got some weird stuff going on in my house. And I just, I guess I'm just telling you because I don't know what, what else to do. And so Michael's like, 
a little bit caught off guard and is a little bit just worried about his friend. Uh, and he starts asking him some basic questions, just, oh, well, what have you heard? Like, you know, what have you seen? Just not really sure if it's even remotely worth exploring, but just asking some basic questions. And as they're having this exchange, the voice that came on the phone during the call to the customer service rep for the internet provider came on the phone. And all of a sudden, Bill can't hear Michael and Michael can't hear Bill. All, all they both hear is this voice, this like angry kind of demonic sounding voice that sounds very threatening. And so while this is going on, Michael just instinctively is like, well, I have all my sound set up here and he grabs a mic and he puts it to the receiver and starts recording. And for a minute and a half, he sits there recording this voice. And then about 30 seconds into the recording, not that Michael could hear it, Bill on the other end, who's heard this voice before, and he's starting to, he's starting to get the feeling that this whole thing is bad, like it's bad. And he starts yelling to Michael to hang up. Don't listen to this, hang up, hang up the phone. Don't listen to the voice, he's yelling for him. And then after about a minute and a half of this chaos that Michael's recording, the voice suddenly stops. And it goes back to Bill and Michael talking to each other. And it's like crystal clear. And so Michael immediately says, hey, Bill, you there, you there? And Bill's like, yeah, I'm here. I was trying to get you to get off the phone. You, you can't listen to this stuff. I don't know what it is, but it's bad. And Michael just goes, no, listen, I recorded that. Here, let me play it back for you. And so he starts playing it back and it's silence, except for when Bill was yelling to Michael, don't listen to it, hang up, hang up, don't listen to it. And Michael is yelling in the beginning to Bill like, hey, what is that? What is this? But then it's all silence in between. So they aren't speaking to each other, even though they're on the phone with each other and they hear something, but the recording only picked up their voices, not the demonic possessed sounding voice. At this point, Bill is starting to get a little bit scared. Maybe he wouldn't admit to it, but he's alone in this house and all the strange stuff is happening. And he just decides that he's gonna invite uh, his brother over for dinner. And Bill is in the chair that he always sits in and Bob and his wife, Cindy, are on the couch and they're kind of having a nice time. Bill recalled feeling, you know, just, it was just nice to have other people in the house. And they're watching TV and as they're watching TV, suddenly uh, Bill just stands up and kind of runs over to the room where he had originally seen that thing dart by, this rodent or whatever he saw. And Bob and Cindy obviously see him get up and run over and they're like, hey, what did you see? What, what was that? And Bill's like, okay, I don't know how to describe what I saw, but I saw this thing that's in my house. And, you know, Bob, I brought you over here because I've, been, I've just been seeing this animal or something running around my house and I swear I just saw it. I swear I just saw it. And he goes, hey, look, Bob, sit in my chair. Because it was the only vantage point into this room, the, the couch where Bob and Cindy were sitting, they couldn't really see into this room. And he goes, just listen to me. Bob, sit in my seat and just, just sit here and just watch the TV. Don't pay attention to the room. Just watch the TV and, and just see if something catches your eye. Because you know maybe, maybe I'm seeing something that is totally rational, but something's happening. Just do what I was doing. And so Bob's like, all right. So he sits in the chair, Bill sits next to Cindy and they start watching TV again. And Bob all of a sudden just clearly reacts to seeing something in the other room. And he goes, oh my God, what is that? And they all stand up and, and Bill is like, well, what'd you see? And Bob's like, I, I don't know. It was like some kind of small animal or something. And it looked like it was on two feet. It did not look like a four-legged animal. That, that's like a two-legged animal. Like, what was that? And so Bob, he's now feeling like, I was in that closet, some weird stuff happened that I didn't tell Bill about. Now this, and he's like, okay, Cindy, his wife. Cindy, you sit in the seat, you do this now. And so now Bill and Bob are sitting on the couch watching Cindy and Cindy's watching the TV. Of course, in just a matter of minutes, she sees something dart across the room. Now, was she just kind of jumping on the bandwagon because these two saw it? Maybe, but she certainly described the same thing that Bill and Bob claimed to have seen, which was a bipedal uh, small creature that was just running through the dining room. And so the three of them, turn on all the lights and they start searching the house. They're, they're gonna find this animal or thing in the house and they search everywhere for hours and they can't find anything. Finally, after, you know, it's getting late, Bob and Cindy are like, hey, Bill, 
I don't know what's happening in your house, but why don't you just come stay with us? We've got a guest room. Just crash with us tonight and you can come back in the morning and call animal control or, or whatever you want to do, but just, you shouldn't be here tonight. There's too many weird things happening here. Bill, in a way, was actually kind of happy because now he had someone that he trusted and loved, his own family, that had confirmed that they were seeing the same things he was. That even though that is terrifying, that all of a sudden Bill is alone in this house with some creature, this small bipedal creature running around the house, at least he wasn't losing his mind. Or if he was, at least other people were too. So he was kind of relieved and he was like, you know what, I'm not gonna go with you because I don't wanna just like give up my house. What will I do when I come back if it keeps happening? Like, I don't wanna just give this up. So Bob and Cindy leave and now Bill is determined to now for the first time start looking up paranormal explanations for what was happening. So quickly, Bill realizes that you can't just search the paranormal. There's too many things online. It's so hard to tell what is considered like credible and what isn't because there's just no fact checking going on. It's just people kind of putting things on the internet. And so what he decided he would do is instead of him doing the research, he would find a paranormal investigative team that at least appeared to approach their investigations much the way a scientist would. That instead of looking for proof, you know, the paranormal exists, instead that their approach would be like looking for an answer, even if that answer was totally normal. And so he starts researching for investigative paranormal teams that have a scientific focus that are in Texas in the area. And he actually finds one and he reaches out to them and they were actually available that night to come over. So he says, please, Come over, I need your help. So the leader of the paranormal team was a man by the name of Brian Hall. And when they get there, it's Brian and a couple of his, of his crew members. They don't start with, you know, diving into the paranormal investigation side. They start by looking for obvious answers because they've found that many times when someone claims they have a paranormal event happening, it's something like, you know, a bad AC unit or a creaky door or a branch outside that's rubbing against the house. And so they did a very lengthy and thorough examination of the outside and inside of the house, looking for things like that. And they determined that there wasn't anything obvious that was a rational explanation. So now it warranted setting up some equipment. And so what they did is they set up a couple of cameras in uh, Bill's bedroom where a lot of the activities apparently was happening. And they set up these laser beams that basically beamed lasers in every direction and they would place them in his bedroom. So there was like laser beams all over the room. And if anything walked past any of these lasers, you would see the beams move and it's very obvious. So it's a way to detect motion in the room. And so they set these, these beams up and they start filming and for a long time, nothing is happening. Bill, Brian Hall, the team are just sitting in the dining room downstairs, just like listening to silence and watching nothing happen. And so Brian suggests, hey, you know, why don't one of his team members go up and just literally interact with the room a little bit. Go in there, kind of like yell, do something, kind of stir it up, so to speak. And then we'll see if anything happens. And so one of the team members goes up to the room and walks in and is like, hey, is anybody in here? And, you know, nothing's happening. You can see on the footage that, you know, he jumps onto the bed and he's sitting on the bed. And at some point, as he's yelling out to whatever was in the room, like, hey, if you're in here, show yourself. All of a sudden on camera, you hear a laser fall. And he jumps out of bed and they, he runs out of the room and the rest of the team comes up and they gather up the cameras and they immediately watch the footage. And as they're watching the footage, you can see this mist that begins to form in the room that the team member who was in there just didn't see and the mist starts swirling in front of the laser beams on the camera before you hear off camera one of the laser beams falling to the ground. So at first they're they're just kind of dumbfounded and they're like, well, how did the mist get in there? Like, what is that? And, and is it possible that perhaps the, the laser beam rolled off a table or something? Maybe it was positioned in such a way that it could have rolled off. And so what they did is they raised the sound levels inside of the actual video and they made out uh, a couple of words. And so at this point, Brian Hall and his team feel like they have quite a bit of data that actually does lend credibility to the idea that there is something paranormal happening in Bill's house. So as they're packing up to leave, they say to Bill, like, you gotta go, you can't be here. Like, I'm surprised you're still here now. 
And Bill just was this super prideful guy and he just was like, no, I'm, I'm gonna stay. Like I've made the decision, I'm not gonna run. I'm gonna stay here in this house. And they're like, that's a bad idea. And honestly, they were right because some pretty horrible stuff happens after they leave. So that night, he knows he's not gonna sleep. So he has all his lights on in his bedroom. He's sitting with his knees tucked up to his chin. He has upbeat music, like classical music, but very upbeat music playing on the radio right next to his bedside. And he's just trying to like kind of create good vibes in his room. And so as he's sitting there, he hears what sounds like a Mack truck smashing into the side of his house. Like it was so loud and just deafening that he instantly sprints out of his door, runs downstairs, runs outside to like inspect the damage to his property. And nothing's outside. There's nothing. There's no Mack truck. There's no damage to his house. There's nothing. He walks all around his property. He's like, did something fall on the street? Am I losing my mind? Like what's going on? And so he goes back in the house after quite a bit of looking around, seeing if something might have fallen off of his roof that made a sound, nothing. He goes back in his house, and as soon as he steps foot in his house, he hears a similarly loud crashing sound, as if you know, a vehicle is smashing into his house, except it's inside of his house, in his dining room. It was in the same room where he first initially spotted that thing running across the ground. And so he runs in there to look for some horrible damage to the inside of his house, but there's nothing disturbed. There's nothing shaking. There's nothing out of place. His dining room is intact. And as he's sitting there, he hears his car alarm go off outside. And now he's thinking, this thing is screwing with me. I'm not gonna let it win. I've stayed here against better judgment for multiple days. I'm not gonna give in now. And so Bill kind of goes into fight mode. Now he's mad. And he's, instead of being scared of what's happening, he starts screaming at the top of his lungs, like, show yourself. And so as he's doing that, he hears yet another loud crashing sound up in his bedroom. And so he runs upstairs ready to you know, fight with whatever this is in his house. It's, just, it's gotten to a breaking point for Bill. He charges in his room, there's nothing in there. But unlike the dining room, and unlike when he was outside, the crashing sound continues while he's in the bedroom. So he's standing in his bedroom, holding his ears from the deafening crashing sounds over and over and over again, but there's nothing moving. There is no way for the sound to be emanating from that room, but it is. And after what feels like an eternity of this horrible smashing sound, it just completely stops and it's dead silence. And Bill like lifts his hands off his ears and he's looking around and you know, he's expecting it to start again, but it doesn't. And it's just dead silence in the entire house. After quite a while, and he still doesn't hear anything, he gets back in his bed, all the lights are on, you know, his radio's on, and he tucks his legs up to his chin and he's just like holding himself basically in the fetal position. And he is, at this point, he's now just petrified. Like he had his big fight moment, but I think he's, he's now thinking that this thing was just challenging me back. It's basically saying, I can do whatever I want to you and you can't touch me. I can do whatever I want, you can't touch me. And he's realizing that maybe he could have made it worse. And he's sitting there knowing he's not gonna sleep. It's still the middle of the night. And he starts hearing a noise that sounds like maybe shuffling, a shuffling of feet, sh something's moving around underneath his bed. And as he's, as he's sitting on his bed, at the head of his bed near his pillow with his feet tucked in, he looks at the foot of his bed and this huge, just wide, six foot tall black figure emerges in pure, it's bright in the room. This black figure emerges at the foot of his bed. It's got this huge tooth coming out of its mouth and it gets into this jerky position and starts moving towards Bill. And it gets right in front of him and it puts its face right against Bill's and then grunts and then disappears. Bill continued to see this horrible black figure in his house and it continued to kind of challenge Bill and Bill stopped challenging it back. And so Bill started waking up with these scratches on his chest. He, uh, he was hospitalized a couple of times, prompting the hospital to do welfare checks on Bill because he was showing up with these like mini heart attacks because of the stress that he claimed was from having this stuff happening to him. And you know, his family's so concerned. And it wasn't until Bill started really doing some aggressive research on demons that he read about uh, exorcisms. And he remembered that when he showed up for that house call, a lot of the language that he was hearing coming from that woman who was screaming, um, you know, leave these people, leave this house, it sounded like an exorcism. And he was thinking that, do you think it's possible 
that the exorcist knew that she needed another host for these demons. And so she planned it so that she would have this water purification person show up right at 5 p.m. so that she could be at the part of her exorcism where she could cast the demons onto him. After two exorcisms of, her, of his own to his house, he, it still hasn't stopped. He's still to this day uh, has, is dealing with the paranormal activity in his house. And when asked why he hasn't sold his house, is he thinks that he couldn't live with himself if he ever put another person through what he has dealt with at his house. I don't know about you, but I would not have lived in that house for an additional 18 years. That just sounds like the worst. But you know, I am, I'm not Bill, and so he's made up his mind that that's what he needs to do. But for me anyways, I would have left that house. I would have abandoned that house more than likely. But I'd love to hear what you would do in that situation. And I'd love to just get your feedback on the story. Uh, it's interesting when you have a story like this coming from the mouth of someone so credible, like a NASA robotics engineer who's inherently skeptical um, and having lots of corroborating evidence. I'd, I'd love to hear what you all think about this particular story and whether you think this is true or just something else that's totally rational and easy to explain. Love to hear in the comments. That's going to do it, guys. Before you go, if you want to get in touch with me, you can message me on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. Also, I'm very active on TikTok. My handle is Mr. Ballin. And if you like this video, again, if you would, please pulverize the like button and turn on all notifications so you can get more of these types of stories. That's going to do it, guys. Take care. Before Herr Baumeister would become a prolific, horrible serial killer, he was a pillar of his community. He was a doting father. He was a loving husband. His neighbors enjoyed spending time with him because he was high energy and he threw great parties. But what people didn't know from outward appearances is that he was schizophrenic and had been diagnosed at a young age. He also had this deep obsession with death and dying that he could never quite shake. His morbid obsession would ultimately take over and he would go on to end the lives of nearly two dozen young men in Indiana. And he would bury the majority of them on his property, which was known as Fox Hollow Farm. When an investigation into all these missing young men in Indiana points at Herb Baumeister being the primary suspect, Baumeister flees his property and ultimately ends his own life. And in the note he leaves, he just says that the reason he's taking his own life is because his business is failing and so is his marriage. He doesn't confess to any of the murders. He doesn't give investigators any indication of how many people uh, he killed or where they are. He didn't give any closure to anyone. He just took his own life and that was that. And so while investigators did a very thorough search of the property that Baumeister owned, the Fox Hollow Farms property, and found over 5,000 human bone fragments and were able to identify a number of victims, they believe that there are more victims buried at Fox Hollow Farms that we may never uncover. So our story picks up over a decade later when two new owners come in, purchase Fox Hollow Farms, and almost immediately some very strange things start happening in and around the property. Then they record this very famous audio recording inside the property, which that in conjunction with the other strange things that they had seen around the property, leads them to believe that Fox Hollow Farms is haunted. So before we get into their story and we listen to that audio recording, if you're interested in strange, dark, and mysterious content like what I'm promising on today's episode, then you've come to the right place because this is the type of content that I produce three to four times a week. And so if that interests you, if you would, please gently assassinate the like button and then turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of these uploads every week. So let's dive in. In 2006, Rob, Vicki Graves, and their two teenage sons were tired of living the city fast-paced lifestyle and decided to, to look for some property in, in suburban Indiana uh, where they could kind of escape that busy lifestyle. And so when they were looking at real estate in some of the nicer suburbs of Indiana, they found this one property called Fox Hollow Farms that was this huge sprawling estate but was selling for some unbelievably cheap price. And so they contact a real estate agent who says, yeah, we'd love to, to give you a tour of the place. It's, it's up for sale no one's occupying it right now. It's owned by an investor, but they are looking to sell obviously. So yeah, let's have, let's do a house tour. And so they're, they're open-minded. They, they, it seems too good to be true, uh, but they decide, you know what, we'll go take a look. And so they get to this property and it's, it's beautiful. 
it is it is everything they wanted their this this dream home they're looking for to be you know it has an indoor swimming pool it's got loads of bedrooms and bathrooms it's it's like basically a mansion and as they're walking around the property Rob is speaking to his wife Vicky and they're both kind of going back and forth like what's wrong with this place this doesn't make any sense Rob starts to wonder wait a second I think I've heard of this place on TV before and he's having like an epiphany and he's like I think that this could actually be the home of one of the most notorious serial killers in Indiana's history Herb Baumeister it's like he it just came to him that the name Fox Hollow Farm was something he remembered hearing on TV. And so he stops the real estate agent on their tour and he says, hey, this, this is a beautiful home, but is this the home of Herb Baumeister? And the real estate agent, almost expecting this to be brought up, was like, yes, that's why it's still in the market. People are, are unwilling to purchase this home, even though the investor who scooped this up uh, in the 90s following the tragedy that was the Herb Baumeister case, uh, the investor had basically gutted the whole residence and basically removed all the kind of remnants of what it used to look like when Herb Baumeister was uh, living there. Uh, nobody wanted it because, you know, Herb Baumeister had killed nearly two dozen young men and buried them on the property and investigators still were finding pieces of bone on the property and they didn't really know how many victims there were. And so it was this kind of spooky place to live. And so the real estate agent just said, that's, that's why it's so cheap. The property is beautiful, it's well kept, but no one wants to be here because of the history. The real estate agent says, here, why don't you and your wife just go talk about it? We can leave if you guys aren't comfortable with this. Ultimately, they decide to purchase the property. So a couple weeks later, Rob and Vicky and their two teenage sons move into Fox Hollow Farms and they love it. And especially the, the, their two teenage sons love swimming in the pool. And they had gotten in the habit of, of basically running around outside and then tracking in dirt and gravel into the swimming pool. Uh, and so one day, Vicky is vacuuming up some of this dirt and gravel that had gotten inside of the, the, the area around the pool. And so she's, she's vacuuming up the, the gravel and all of a sudden her vacuum cuts out. And the, in fact, the power cord where the vacuum was attached to had come undone. And so she thinks, oh, I must have you know, yanked on the cord and, and pulled it out of the, the outlet. And so she goes over and she plugs it back in and she goes back to vacuuming up the, the gravel that was in the pool. And so as she's doing that, it goes out again, which surprised her because she remembered thinking to herself, like, don't yank on the cord because you just unplugged it. And she turns around and now the, the cord from the vacuum and the outlet it was plugged into are separated by about a foot. That it, it was as if it had been like yanked out pretty hard. And she's thinking to herself like, did I just yank on it again? Like, am I wrapped on a chair or something? Like, how did I yank it out? And how did it move a foot away from the outlet? And so after she plugs it in, she checks it and kind of yanks on it uh, to make sure it's not falling out on its own. Like it's not a, you know, kind of weak connection to the port. And it's not, it's in there secure. And she goes back to vacuuming and she's looking over her, her shoulder and checking the outlet as she's vacuuming, like wondering like, what was causing it to, to pop out of the socket like that? And as she's looking at it, she watches it pop out of the socket again, except it didn't just fall to the ground. It like jumped out as if there was a surge of electricity that, you know, popped it out of the socket or something. And she drops the vacuum because it startled her and she, she didn't know what to make of it. Rob worked at a car dealership and one of his employees, Joe, was chronically late. And it got to the point where Rob's like, Joe, what's going on? Like, why are you always late? And Joe said, you know, I live over an hour away and I just, I can't get here on time. I gotta find somewhere, you know, to live that's closer to the dealership. And Rob is like, well, actually, we have an entire apartment attached to our residence at Fox Hollow Farms that no one's staying in. We'd be happy to let you rent that out. It's right down the road. And Joe's like, actually, that sounds pretty great. And so just a couple days later, Rob helps Joe move into the new apartment. And they spend the whole day moving all the boxes and furniture in there. And just in the span of just a few hours, they move everything into Joe's apartment. Rob leaves, Joe is exhausted. It's just he and his dog, Fred. And Joe just decides to crash for the night and he lays down on the bed and falls asleep. And so that night he has this dream where he's being chased by someone. He doesn't know what it is, but it causes him to actually act out his dream, like sleepwalk. He jumps up out of his bed and starts running as if he needs to escape the apartment, but he's like kind of half dreaming. And he runs into the door frame, falls to the ground, knocks a glass over and actually cuts his hands up pretty bad. 
And so he like comes to and he's like looking around and he's like, what was that? So a couple days later, Vicky comes home and she finds Rob painting the side of the house. And she and Rob stop and are talking about how beautiful it's gonna look when the painting's done. And, and out of the corner of her eye, Vicky sees something in the forest that was on the edge of their property. And it was actually a man standing with a red t-shirt on, just standing like looking at their property. And as she's looking at him, he turns around and he starts walking away farther into the forest. And so she kind of looks and before she says anything to Rob, the guy has just vanished into the woods. And so she just goes, Rob, Rob, I, I just saw someone standing on our property. He had a red shirt on and he was right over there. And Rob immediately is like, well, you know, honestly, we moved into a serial killer's house. We should accept that there's gonna be people that are just gonna wanna sneak onto our property to get a look at this building. And so they walk over to where Vicky has seen this guy in red and they look and, and you know, there, there's no one there. They yell out like, hey, is anybody here? And, and no one's there. And so even though it was pretty unsettling, Vicky and Rob just decide that, I guess this is a reality of living here is that you're gonna have people spying on you a little bit because of the notoriety of, of the home. So later that night, Joe is in his apartment and he's doing some dishes and it's, it's late at night, probably like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And he hears a knock on the door and he's literally mid dishes, his hands are wet. And so he turns off the water and he yells out, hey, just a second. And he starts toweling off his hands. And as he's doing that, the knocking gets louder and more aggressive. And he's like, hey, hold on, I'm just drying my hands off, hold on. And he assumes it's Vicky or Rob. And so he starts walking over and the knocking is just incessant. And he finally opens the door and no one's there. It wasn't like the knocking was going on and stopped. And then he went over there and opened it. It was literally like the knocking was happening as he's opening the door and no one is standing there. He's like immediately on guard. Like, okay, is someone like on the roof, like bending down? Is someone hiding? Like what's going on? And he kind of pokes his head out and he's looking around and he actually steps out onto the, the front steps there and he's looking around and he figured like if someone had knocked, they'd be running away if they're gone already and he can't hear anything. It's just silent. There's no one there. And then he goes back into his apartment, shuts it, bolts the door shut and out of the corner of his eye, he spots what looks like a man in his bedroom, basically just walking past the door frame into his bedroom and it totally startles him. His dog starts growling and looking in the direction of the bedroom. And so he walks over there and looks in his bedroom and there's nothing there. He flips on all the lights, he looks around and he's like, what's going on here? Like it totally, totally scared him. So Joe had only been in this apartment for about three weeks. And one of the things he had kind of developed a, a habit doing was in the evenings, he would take his dog, Fred, for a walk along the driveway that was you know, well lit and the driveway was pretty long. It was a big piece of property and he would take his dog up to the end of the driveway and then walk back. And because of what he's just witnessed with the knocking on the door and what looked like someone in his apartment, he decides he just wants to clear his head and go on a walk with his dog. And he figured he could maybe swing by the main house and see if the lights were on in Rob and Vicky's house because in some way, maybe if their lights were on, it would indicate that maybe they had been over and had been knocking on the store and tomorrow he'll find out what it was about. Like he's searching for a way to rationalize this. And he notices right away that Vicky and Rob's house is totally dark, they're asleep. He doesn't make it very far when his dog stops. The dog starts taking off into the tree line. And before Joe actually takes off after his dog, he looks up and he breaks out through some of the lighting over the driveway that there is a man in red with a red t-shirt that's at the edge of the forest and it's his back is turned and he's walking into the forest and as Joe's looking it looks like the man in red actually disappears and so the dog is heading straight for this man in red and so Joe because it's his dog he loves his dog he starts running after the dog even though he's absolutely terrified of what's going to happen here he just he couldn't let his dog get harmed so he chases into the woods makes it like a few feet into the woods where he finds his dog that's now not barking and is actually facing back out at Joe. And it's kind of cowering, looking at where Joe is now standing. And Joe kind of begins to turn and the man in red is standing right next to him, looking directly at Joe. And Joe just panics and starts running out, doesn't stop to do anything. The dog follows Joe and they run back to Joe's apartment, run upstairs, shut the door, shut the blinds, lock everything and they just sit there. For the rest of the night, Joe is literally checking his window and looking outside because he doesn't know if he, if he just saw that or not because that person in red had vanished a minute ago. He thought that perhaps he was convincing himself that he saw someone in red because 
he had just seen like a ghost in his apartment like a few minutes earlier and he's starting to think that maybe he's just kind of hallucinating all this stuff or that he's imagining all this stuff so he wasn't quite prepared to go tell rob and vicky or do anything about it so he just spent the night basically looking out his window and making sure no one was coming into his residence again and so the next morning goes and tells Rob and Vicky what happened the night before. Everything from the knocking on the door to the uh, person that he thought he saw inside of his apartment to then ultimately the man in red that his dog chased after. As he's telling them about this, this exchange with the man in red, Vicky is getting pretty emotional. And Vicky is like, I saw a man in red and she points to the area of their property and it's the same area that uh, Joe had just been describing where this had all happened. She was like, I saw a man in red right over there. Like, what's going on? So that night, Joe was in his apartment and Joe is definitely on edge about what had happened the night before. He's increasingly almost listening for noises outside because of how scary the night before was. And uh, he foregoes his walk on the driveway with his dog. I think he's pretty much done doing that after that encounter. And as he's in his apartment, he hears knocking on the door again. And he yells, who is it? Who's at the door? And no answer, but the knocking continues. And it's one of those knockers. It's the actual uh, knocker on the outside of the door that's being hit over and over again. He can see the door actually shaking from how hard this is being banged against the door. And finally, after like poking his head out and seeing no one, he rips the door open and no one's there. And he looks at the door itself and the knocker, is perpendicular to the ground, like someone's holding it up, but no one's there. And as he's looking at it, it swings down and knocks the door one last time. He slams the door shut, locks it, and he's absolutely petrified. He sees the doorknob on the door start to turn. He can hear the sound of the spring tightening as the doorknob slowly turns all the way over into the open position. The door's locked, but the doorknob's been twisted. And he's looking at the door, and then there's silence after the doorknob's being held in the, call it, open position. And then all of a sudden it bursts open, breaking the lock, no one's outside. And he looks at it and he's absolutely frozen for a second. And then he just runs out of his apartment to see who is doing this. No one's there. When he turns around and looks into his apartment, he sees a man in white, not in red, who is soaked head to toe, screaming and running towards him, who runs out of the apartment past him and vanishes into the air. And so he takes off, Joe, he's not sticking around, grabs his dog, runs to, to Rob and Vicky's, and he goes in and tells them what happened. Joe, Rob, and Vicky are so scared that now they're not even, they're not trying to rationalize that this wasn't a ghost, let's say. They're trying to convince themselves that this is a friendly ghost that these are the victims of Herbert Baumeister uh, that have been tormented by Baumeister, but they're here because they're trapped here. That man you saw in your apartment, you know, that was a victim of Herbert Baumeister, escaping from Herbert Baumeister. You know, the man in red, that was a victim of Herbert Baumeister. We're dealing with the victims here because so many people had their lives snuffed out here. And so they're, it isn't really calming them, but it's like they're creating a narrative that fits what's happening because without a story, this is impossible to understand. And so they really start to believe that what they're experiencing is a haunting, but it is of Herb Baumeister's victims basically acting out their final moments or kind of leading them to you know what happened to these victims. And so that night, Joe, Rob, and Vicky start going online and researching who the victims were, uh, the known victims of Herb Baumeister. And there's images of all of these different victims. And as they're scrolling through all the pictures, Joe stops them on one and he goes, that's the guy that was in my apartment. That looks exactly like the guy that was soaking wet, screaming that ran out of my apartment. Like that confirms, this is a confirmation to the three of them, that the, the entity they're experiencing in this property uh, is definitely the victim. So they, they do feel reassured at this point, scared, but reassured that these are the victims. And so they start really aggressively researching the Baumeister case and they come to realize that there's actually a number of victims, more than likely, that have not been uncovered, that have been buried on this property, only lending, in their mind, more credibility to the idea that this is a property that is haunted by the victims of Herb Baumeister. And so after a couple of days where there isn't much activity, 
Joe decides to go for a walk in the woods in the same area where the man in red had been seen by Vicky and by himself a couple days earlier. And he just decides, you know, in broad daylight, I'm gonna go for a walk with my dog out in the woods. And so he starts walking in that direction and literally sitting on the leaves, uh, like practically on the trail in plain sight is a human bone. It's a femur bone just sitting on, uh, on the trail. Like the idea that that bone wouldn't have been located during the extensive search for bones on this property is nearly impossible. To, to Joe, the way he described it is, I feel like that bone was left there for me to discover it. That the man in red, who was more than likely a victim of her Baumeister, had led us, had led me to finding that bone. And so they believe, Joe, Rob, and Vicky, that when they send this bone in for forensic analysis, that they'll determine that this was another victim that perhaps hasn't been identified yet. And they're kind of expecting it to be um, the man in red, whoever that was. And so they, they end up calling, Rob ends up calling the lead detective from the Baumeister case and says, hey, we found a bone. Uh, and so they submit that uh, and they take it in as evidence. And Rob asks the lead investigator if he would mind coming to the property and just kind of explaining to them, you know, where things occurred on the property relative to the Baumeister case. Where did all the tragedy unfold? Like, where were people buried? Just to give us a sense of what we're dealing with here. And so the investigator agrees and the, the investigator comes out and the vast majority of the killings happened in the swimming pool where Baumeister would basically lure young men to come to his property to go swimming. And as soon as they got in the pool, uh, he would strangle them to death. And the weird thing about the pool area is that Baumeister was, well, a psychopath and was, he had put mannequins all over the inside of this swimming pool that had like party outfits on. And so there are these very eerie pictures of the swimming pool with like mannequins all around the outside. And it's, it was basically a place where he lured his victims and ended their lives. A couple days later, Joe is in his apartment and you know, he's doing some work at his computer and he hears a metallic scraping sound uh, coming from his kitchen. And so he goes over to his kitchen and he finds that all of the knives that were in his butcher's block have been pulled out and lined up neatly in the bottom of his sink, like very neatly arranged. And he's looking at it like, I didn't do that. And he turns towards his workstation, like as if to like look around the room. And he notices on the island that sits where he was standing right in front of him, a little bit low down, like halfway up the island, there was all these fresh cut marks in the wood, like quite a, like a number of cut marks across the wood. And he's looking at that and he's thinking to himself, is this one of the victims telling me that, you know, perhaps they had been attacked with a knife right here in the kitchen? He's thinking like it's his duty to, to try to figure out uh, which victim this was and what happened to them. And so, and so he gets his iPhone out and he turns on the voice recorder and he starts recording and asking some questions uh, of the room. And he make, first makes sure to turn off the TV, turn off the AC so it's quiet. And so with his recorder, he starts asking like, who's anybody here? And there's silence. And he's like, uh, who was the person in the kitchen? Who was walking through the kitchen? and there's silence. And then when he asks again about, was there anybody in the kitchen, his dog starts growling and, and reacting to something in the room. And now Joe hasn't heard anything. He's not heard any confirmation that, you know, there's someone in the room. He actually felt quite silly doing it. He takes his phone back to his computer because he takes his dog growling as maybe somehow confirmation that there was something there. And he downloads the, the audio file and he listens to it. And as he's listening to the file, right after he asks about the, is there anybody in the kitchen, he gets a response. Who keeps walking in the kitchen? Married one. Who's in the kitchen? The married one. And so as Joe is looking through all their files, he's seeing that every single victim was single. No one's married. They're all young men who are single. The only one who was married involved in this case was none other than the serial killer himself, Herb Baumeister. And so Joe has had this revelation and, it, and it's when he realizes that it's not just the victims here. Herb Baumeister, the serial killer himself, is haunting this property. So I'd love to hear what you think is going on at Fox Hollow Farm, uh, whether this is a haunting with Herb Baumeister himself showing himself and speaking on audio files, or if this is just a big hoax. 
I'd love to hear what you think. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with me, uh, please direct message me on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. I'm also very active on TikTok. My handle is mrballin over there as well. And again, if you haven't already, please gently assassinate the like button and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss my three to four weekly uploads that look and sound an awful lot like this one. That's going to do it, guys. Thank you very much, guys, for sticking around till the very end, and I will talk to you soon. This is why you should always trust your gut. In the 1970s, a young couple decided to go for a late night hike in the woods. A couple minutes into their walk, and the man remembers thinking, something's not right. He tells his girlfriend, but they just decide to ignore it and keep going, until he steps on something that felt really soft, like it was alive. Before he has a chance to see what he stepped on, they hear all this rustling in the bushes next to them, and they bolt. Years later, that couple turns on the TV, and a death row inmate who's about to be executed is being interviewed. And they ask him, was there ever a time that you were almost caught red-handed? He responded, yes, one time. I was in the woods and a couple walked through and the man actually stepped on the body of a girl I had just killed. I was hiding in the bushes just a few feet away. They didn't see me. That couple had run into one of the worst serial killers of all time, Ted Bundy. You're about to listen to one of the creepiest recordings on the internet. In 2013, a woman who lived alone kept waking up to these loud clicking sounds in her bedroom. So she went out and got an audio recorder and started recording her sleep. For the first month, she doesn't pick up anything other than normal sleeping sounds. And then one morning she gets up and listens to it and she hears herself sleep talking and someone talks back. After she uploaded it to the internet, experts confirmed that it was authentic and that she could not have made that voice. Remember, your Amazon Alexa is always listening. In 2018, a girl named Alexa came home to her apartment to find her creepy stalker landlord in her kitchen. She screams and threatens to call the cops, and he just smiles and says, I was just checking in on you, and leaves. Feeling totally sketched out, she spends the next few hours down the hall in her friend's apartment before finally going back to her room to go to bed. That night, she woke up to her Amazon Alexa responding to someone in the room. It said, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Did you say, I'm watching you? The girl instantly turns on her lights and looks around, but no one's there. So she unplugs Alexa and is about to go back to sleep when she hears what sounds like a man grunting in her closet. As she's staring at her closet, her Alexa turns back on. If you're alone right now, don't watch this video. In the winter of 2018, a man who was living alone in the mountains wakes up to find a red ball sitting on his front yard. He assumed the only neighbor he had must have kids, and so he kicks the ball over the fence, goes inside, doesn't think anything of it. That night, he wakes up to the sound of kids laughing outside of his window. He goes outside to check on them because it's the middle of the night, and there's no kids anywhere, but that red ball is back on his property. So he picks it up, brings it in his house, and goes back to bed. The next morning, he goes over to his neighbor's house to let them know that their kids were out in his yard in the middle of the night. But it turns out his neighbor is just some old man who lives alone, and there aren't any kids anywhere in the area. That night, he wakes up again to the sound of kids on his property, and when he looks outside, there's no kids, but that red ball is back on his property. Panicked, he runs downstairs to make sure the one he brought in is still inside, and it's gone. He checked every window and door, and everything was still locked. It didn't make any sense. He decides to look out the window one more time, and off in the distance is some weird, stiff figure watching him. This is why you should be very careful who you talk to online. A 16-year-old girl was home with her mom when she got a disturbing text message from a boy she had recently met on Snapchat. He told her he was right outside of her house, but when she went to look, no one was there. Frightened, she decides to sleep in her mom's room that night, and right before she goes to bed, she gets another text from the boy that just says, I'm in your house. She shows her mom, who immediately searches the whole house, checks every door, turns on every light. There's no one there. So even though they're creeped out, they go back to bed. The next morning she gets up and she goes back to her bedroom and immediately feels like she's being watched. She checks in her closet, looks behind her door, there's no one there. Then she noticed that the shoe boxes she normally kept perfectly arranged next to her bed had been moved. So she crouches down to put them back in order and then out of the corner of her eyes she notices something. The boy who was texting her was under her bed. Boy, did this kid pick a good night to have his phone out filming. In 2008, a teen decided he wanted to film himself playing the very creepy midnight game. 
In a nutshell, you turn off all the lights in your house and you walk around from midnight to 3.33 a.m. And if at any point you stop moving, the midnight man will attack you. Around 2 a.m., the kid thinks he hears something in the kitchen, but he also thinks his mind's just playing tricks on him because he is playing this game. But he goes to check it out anyways. When he gets downstairs, he doesn't hear anything, but he does see that his door is now open. And when he goes to shut it, someone pushes back. <laughs> He sprints away, goes upstairs, jumps into his room, but keeps filming. <laughs> this is why you should never talk to strangers. In the early 2000s, a young girl was waiting outside her friend's house, peeling the bark off of a tree, when a strange man approaches her. As he got closer, she could see that he was grinning ear to ear and his face was white as a ghost. He walks right up to her and pinches her on the arm and says, how would you like it if I peeled your skin off? Just then, her friend's mom yells for her to come inside and the man walks away. It would be years before the girl's mother would finally tell her who this man really was. Her friend's mom had seen the man pinch her on the arm and had immediately called the police, who quickly rounded this guy up. Plastered all across the inside of his van were dozens of pictures of this girl, but what they found in his storage locker is straight out of a nightmare. In the locker was a chair with hand and arm restraints, next to it was an anatomy book, and hundreds of torture tools. This is why you should always take your lockdown drills seriously. In 2017, two 16-year-olds were in their school bathroom when the lights suddenly went out and their school went into lockdown. Feeling rebellious, they decide, you know what, let's go explore the school a little bit first and then we'll go follow procedure. They step out of the bathroom and look down the hall towards their classroom and they see this large figure standing in front of their classrooms. It's definitely not a student, it's not a teacher. He's got ragged clothes on and he starts walking towards them. They dart right back into the bathroom to the corner stall where they hide, praying that that man didn't see them. The man bursts in and starts yanking open all the stalls. Not wanting to see what happens when he gets to their stall, they get on the ground and start crawling to the side of the room where they finally get up and make a run for the door. They look back and he's holding a gun. The boys manage to get away safely and no one's hurt, but the police never capture the ragged man. Be careful what you put in your body. In 2014, a couple returned to their home to find it trashed in baffling ways. There was lotion all over the door handles, all of their shoes had had their soles ripped off of them, and someone had dumped an entire can of paint all over the toilet. Despite the obvious break-in, the police come and can't find any evidence of theft, so they leave thinking the couple's not in danger anymore. That night, the couple hears scratching underneath their bed and what sounds like a crying animal. Not wanting to find out what it was, they leave and call the cops who come right back and start investigating the house, and they make a startling discovery in their bedroom. Wedged underneath the couple's bed was this 90 pound tiny little woman carrying a huge butcher's knife and a hypodermic needle. As they're taking this crazy lady away in handcuffs, one of the officers comes over to the couple and is like, so she was high on meth and for at least two hours, she had been burrowing a hole in the underside of your mattress with that knife to get to you. Sometimes monsters are real. After his parents fell asleep at night, a nine-year-old would sneak downstairs into the kitchen and crush junk food. One night, as he's making his way downstairs, he swears he can hear someone in the kitchen, but his whole family's upstairs asleep. He peeks his head around the corner, and in the kitchen is this skinny man drinking milk straight from the carton with his back turned. The boy's terrified, sprints upstairs, tells his parents, who come right downstairs, they can't find anything. It looks like no one's been in the kitchen. And they ultimately blame their son, and they say, your imagination's just playing tricks on you. The kid knows what he saw, and for the next few days, he felt like everywhere he went in the house, he was being watched. Then one night, he's laying in bed, looking at the vent on his ceiling, and he sees a pair of eyes looking down at him. Freaks out, runs to his parents, who come in, look everywhere, find nothing, and blame him again. A couple of weeks go by, and the boy starts to notice a terrible smell coming out of the vent on his ceiling. He convinces his parents to come in and actually cut into the ceiling and go look around, and they find that skinny man, and he's dead. This is why you should never live next to crazy people. In 2015, a girl who was totally fed up with her noisy neighbors finally worked up the courage to go over there and tell them to be quiet. She knocks on the door and out walks this insane looking old woman who just starts hissing at her. And she doesn't stop hissing at her until the girl finally just leaves. She considers calling the police, but ultimately just goes back to her room and goes to bed. But she wakes up a couple hours later when she hears that same hissing sound. Her first thought is there's no way this can be my neighbor because she had her door locked. 
But then she notices there's a big lump right next to her in her bed and she reaches over to check who it is. Her crazy neighbor leaps out of bed and runs into the closet. No one would believe this story if there wasn't a video. In 2013, a rogue wave capsized a tugboat, killing 11 of 12 men on board. The 12th man was flung into the hallway, which was already filled with water. Panicked, he starts swimming towards the exit, but accidentally goes into the engine room where he finds an air pocket. And there this poor man sat, listening to the sounds of these huge sharks fighting over the bodies of his friends just on the other side of the wall. Total darkness, no food or water, 100 feet below the surface. Three days later, one of the divers that was sent down there to retrieve their bodies sees a hand. He's alive, he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Okay. All right. Harrison O'Keen survived the ordeal and plans on writing a book.